Hello everyone, let's think about pragmatism in Singapore. In the next decade, Singapore's most challenging problems will likely result from two mutually reinforcing global trends. They are neoliberal globalization and authoritarian populism. To avert dystopian futures that can result from being stuck in the intersection of these two trends, Singapore must turn away from debased and irrelevant forms of pragmatism to more thoughtful forms. That is to say, Singapore needs to embrace a pragmatism that is not, ironically, trapped within dogmatic assumptions about nature and circumstance, that does not amount to blind faith in the market, and is not simply addressed to a middle ground construed as a simplistic calculation of some imagined numerical majority's preferences. Instead, for Singapore to be resilient in the face of these destructive global trends, its pragmatism needs to be transformative, animated by the exercise of philosophical judgment, energized by creativity and optimism, enabled by civic skills and democratic capabilities, and freed from the crippling effects of a politics of paranoia and mistrust. Neoliberal globalization, a global trend since the 1970s, has seen the vigorous promotion of markets in countries around the world through policies of privatization, liberalization, deregulation, and free trade. In many countries, including Singapore, this has not led to a rolling back, but in fact, a strengthening of the state. Singapore's government is now even more technocratic, managerial, business-minded, elitist, and one might argue authoritarian, as it asserts greater, more sophisticated, and technologically assisted social control to advance the economic growth agenda. Prioritizing economic growth by making the local labor force conducive to the profit-making agenda of the international business elite can have a debilitating impact on democracy and the more socially progressive and egalitarian goals of a country. Culturally, neoliberalism can also degrade a society's values or make it near impossible to forge new ones. For example, a sense of community, solidarity, and moral responsibility can easily break down into a crude form of economic Darwinism. Such a society encourages selfish and competitive individualism, celebrates individuals who have succeeded according to the narrow and sometimes superficial terms of the market, and demonizes those who have fallen through the cracks as being completely at fault for their own failure. For such a society whose perverted belief in meritocracy has obscured the social, cultural, and economic forces that bestow systematic advantages to some while limiting opportunities for others can generate egotistical winners, convinced of their own superiority and hard work, and of how much they deserve their winnings, which turn out never to be enough. Outside the winner's circle, people helplessly and grudgingly come to accept their failures as a result of their own shortcomings, increasingly blind to the malfunction of social mobility. With the intensification of globalization and the widely anticipated technological disruptions to the economy in city-state Singapore, income, wealth, and other social inequalities will widen and deepen further. The cost of living will continue to rise and more groups of Singaporeans will be, or at least feel, poor in a dense city ranked among the world's wealthiest. 
these trends will have a negative effect on social, physiological, and psychological well-being. And yet, instead of endeavoring to ensure social security and a dignified life for all by redistributing the nation's resources more generously and ingeniously, policymakers seem determined to continue to hoard the nation's wealth in the dogmatic belief that more generous assistance will lead to laziness and dependency. They seem determined to keep Singapore's labor costs attractively cheap for foreign investors and to advise its people to live frugally, an approach that is aligned with the austerity that neoliberal globalization demands. If these conditions persist, Singapore is headed for a future when its already multicultural society will become polarized or fractured in more complicated and problematic ways, with generalized trust and social capital becoming a rapidly depleting resource. Such conditions provide fertile ground for authoritarian populism to take root. All that needs to happen is for a charismatic demagogue to take advantage of visceral feelings of hardship and resentment with a view to mobilizing a collective sense of victimhood directed against a demonized establishment. The demagogue rallies a mass following and assumes political leadership by making irresponsible and unfeasible promises that they simply cannot keep, while quietly drawing personal benefit from the tenaciously neoliberal regime. The public sphere as a space for deliberating on matters of public morality is reduced to distractive moral panics raised against typical scapegoats such as foreigners, minoritized racial and sexual groups, unwed mothers, teenage gangs, and so on. This space is also flooded with hypocritical uses of nationalistic fervor, stoked in the interests of scapegoating political opponents and even those who simply offer alternative and critical perspectives that the regime regards as inconvenient. Now this could all happen to Singapore. One could argue, convincingly, that a pragmatic approach to governance and policy making has in fact been at the heart of the Singapore success story, particularly in the decades after its independence. In the Singapore context, pragmatism referred to a practical, dynamic, problem-solving, results-minded culture, relatively free of the rigidities that came with ideological dogma and moralistic proscriptions, unless ideology or moralism served an instrumental purpose to achieve some desired outcomes. Such a culture infused into the mindset of resourceful, creative and effective political leaders and policymakers alike enabled Singapore to take big strides in its development agenda progressing quickly to become an advanced industrial society. Indeed, the Singapore experience of development and governance has today become a model that many other developing and advanced countries have attempted to emulate. And yet, it is precisely this spectacle of success and dogged commitment to the tried and tested methods to achieve it that can tragically lead to a downturn in Singapore's fortunes. Pragmatism, having led Singapore to success, now gives way to formulaic application, bureaucratic and careerist incentives, and heightened arrogance that dismisses alternative views that are unsolicited. Mm. And this, in spite of the fact that the same material success has shaped succeeding generations of more sophisticated, well-educated, well-traveled, entrepreneurial, and even public-spirited Singaporeans who now make up 
a much more variegated society that is much less inspired by monological and top-down national narratives of danger, survival, and success. In this new society, other values and less tangible and materialistic public goods, such as equality, cultural vibrancy, nat natural heritage, and emotional and spiritual wellness compete with the preeminence of economic growth, social cohesion, and political stability enshrined in the official national narrative. There are at least three specific ways in which Singapore's pragmatism has started to degrade. The first has to do with the realist aspect of pragmatism. The government is thought to be realistic in the way it accepts the world as it is and looks for technical solutions around pre-given conditions. For example, it believes that racial identities are primordial and so forging a national identity must build upon pre-given racial identities. Another example is the government's belief that Singaporeans will abuse more generous redistributive programs. These have become state dogmas, but worse, they prevent the leadership from taking a more transformational approach, which can elevate people's imaginations and aspirations beyond the limits of the mundane, thereby gradually modifying the constraints of the present to open up radically new opportunities for Singapore. This requires patience, which Singapore-style pragmatism, always seeking instant results, does not have. For instance, the government would rather import foreign talent and the super-rich to secure instant success for Singapore than to authentically nurture homegrown talent that would take just too much time. Trickle-down economics, a dogma of neoliberal globalization that asserts that everyone will benefit to some degree, is usually the justification given for this approach. Secondly, Singapore's pragmatism is degrading into blind faith in the market. Market fundamentalism is at the heart of neoliberal globalization. At one level, this has involved reducing national deliberation into technocratic decisions achieved through some variant of cost-benefit analysis. In a sense, this is an abdication of deep and conscientious judgment in favor of a mechanistic means to attain decisions that do not require much imagination or courage. At its worst, the approach reduces all that is valuable to monetary considerations. At another level, subjecting all spheres of human activity to the logic of the market transforms and may even corrupt these spheres. The criticism surrounding very high salaries to attract the most talented Singaporeans to join the ministerial cabinet is not only about the quantum of these salaries, but also about the way that thinking about public service through the hard logic of the market degrades and may irreversibly corrupt public service itself. This will have a bearing on the type of people who will be attracted to Singapore's public service in the future. Thirdly, Singapore's pragmatism is degrading into some vacuous notion of a middle ground construed as a simple calculation of an imagined numerical majority's preferences. The widespread notion of a silent majority, which is assumed to be supportive of the government, and a vocal minority, assumed to be publicly audible, usually pushing rudely for change, but largely unrepresentative, attests to the simplistic notion of democracy in Singapore. Authoritarian populism en encourages this way of thinking and offers leaders the 
option of summoning the specter of the silent majority whenever they face uncomfortable opposition. The government's very odd refusal to abolish anti-gay legislation to appease what they call a conservative majority while giving assurances to progressive Singaporeans that it will not act upon these laws points not only to its lack of transformational leadership, but possibly also to a populist politics of distraction. Now faced with challenges augmented by neoliberal globalization and authoritarian populism, Singapore needs to go beyond a more conservative goal of national integration and aim instead for national resilience. Pragmatism of a kind worked well for developing Singapore, but this pragmatism is slowly degrading into a fig leaf, hiding neoliberal dogmas that can not only erode community and moral responsibility, but also encourage populism in the absence of social capital and strong civic and democratic institutions. Furthermore, evolving circumstances demand new ways of thinking, which a degraded pragmatism is incapable of facilitating. Thus, Singapore needs not only to reclaim the pragmatism of its early decades, but also to repurpose it for the present. A new, thoughtful pragmatism would be transformative, not satisfied with accepting old limitations as eternally unchangeable. It would be animated by the exercise of deep and collective philosophical judgment, rather than a superficial, automatic calculus of costs and benefits measured in terms of dollars and cents. It would be energized by creativity and optimism rather than drained by a self-defeating and sometimes politically disingenuous insistence on Singapore not being ready for anything. It would be enabled by civic skills and democratic capabilities whose development have been arrested by a paternalistic state comfortable with infantilizing Singaporeans as customers rather than citizens. And it would be freed from the crippling effects of a hyperbolic politics of paranoia and mistrust, which always assumes the worst of everything and everyone. Singapore is unlikely to succeed in becoming thoughtfully pragmatic without the immediate and active participation and even leadership of the ruling People's Action Party. It will need to bring together diverse voices and perspectives in confidence, empathy, mutual respect, and good faith under a big tent where difficult questions may be addressed without fear or condescension. The process will necessarily be slow and even and unevenly successful. From a position of strength today, Singapore can still undertake these risks to build that big tent. However, the temptation confronting the government will be to harden up in the face of critical alternatives, as more challenging circumstances make its performance legitimacy a more elusive prospect. But this would make Singapore anything but resilient. To build capacity for a more thoughtfully pragmatic big tent Singapore, education will have to play a significant role. Alongside the need to prepare students for jobs and the future economy, education must also treat preparation for active citizenship with equal importance. This goes beyond simply rethinking the current programs in civic education, as challenging as that task already is schools and higher education institutions will need to focus consciously on fundamental skills of reasoning, critical thinking, argumentation, and cross-cultural communication across the curriculum, with a view to equipping future citizens with the ability and the confidence to engage with one another in a renewed public sphere that Singapore so desperately needs.